Hello, Psych 101 students. We are up to learning objective eight in module one, and we are gonna continue to talk about experiments. And in particular, we have three major topics in this learning objective, experimental control and random samples and random assignment. Let's get into it. <laughs> okay, so as it says here, Control is necessary to determine causality. A properly performed experiment depends on control, which are steps to minimize that anything other than the independent variable will affect the outcome. So remember the basic logic of the experiment is that we only have one thing different between the two groups. That That is ex so extremely important because if there's anything else different between the two groups, well, that may be the cause of the results and not what you, not the independent variable that you're, you're testing. Um, so we, if we have, and, you know, maybe even accidentally have something else that's different, then we don't know for sure what may have caused the dependent variable to change. And sometimes it can be, it can be something like, that you that you know a, a rookie experimenter doesn't even think of maybe they they're running the the weight loss study and and they sign up uh 100 subjects into the into the experimental group one week and then the next week they they have the they sign up 100 people for the control group well that's really sloppy to separate them out you know, one week versus the second week, because there may be something that happens in the world or, or you know, the, that affects one group and not the other, because one group's coming the first week, the other group comes the second week. Maybe the, that weekend in between, there's a movie, a documentary, and a lot of the people, a lot of people watch it, and it inspires people to start to lose weight. It's a documentary about obesity or something, like, whatever and then the second group that comes in they've watched a lot of them have watched the movie they're in a different headspace anyways um it even something like let's say every morning i i collect i i subjects come in and i put them in one group um the control group and then in the afternoon i put subjects in the experimental group even that is it would could possibly affect the results because weight changes during the day so if i have all the people you know in one group that come in during the morning and then in the second group i have people coming in during the afternoon well just because the day because they're coming at different times that would, could possibly affect the results because i'm doing an initial weighing of them and weight changes during the day um plus morning people are inherently different than afternoon people like let's say you had a chance to sign up, you know, more if you were like go getters, they they're probably more likely to to you know try to lose weight knowing that they're in a weight loss study. The afternoon people are more slackers and they're not gonna do anything special. But anyways, you have to be careful like not to do anything else different. Even like things like like when you sign them into the experiment, when you weigh them, um uh who who is it that's giving that's um uh, meeting these these participants like you want the same person whether they're in the experiment or control group because even something like that could have an effect you know you have i don't know a, a pretty nurse in one group and a i don't know a ugly doctor in another group i don't know whatever but like signing up the other group like even something like that could encourage one group oh she's so pretty i'm going to lose weight for her like i don't know but I, I, i'm just kind of winging it here but it, it is that but what the point I'm making is it can be just small mistakes that cause a, another difference to appear between groups. This is why control is so important. You want to, everything to be equal, except once again, that one thing, that independent variable. When something else isn't equal, we call it confound. It's anything that could affect a dependent variable and that may unintentionally vary between the studies, different experimental conditions, such as signing one group up in the morning versus the other group at night. Obviously, what I want to do is 
you know, as people come in, this person's in the control group, this person's experimental, like, like, you know, they both come in, they, like, they flip-flop, you know, so that you get the same number of people during a single day in both groups, and, you know, then that they, you get the same number of people that came in the morning or in both groups and things like that. And you have to, and this, you have to actually think of these things when you run an experiment. It's, it's an art form to run a really well-controlled experiment and have no confounds. Um, so a confound, is, as it says here, is a source of error. It's something else that could have affected the dependent variable, the results, the data. Um, and our experiment, or, you know, the experiment I've been describing, the, the, the weight loss pill experiment, it actually has a confound in it. And some of you probably picked up on it. You probably had a word go through your mind. Why aren't you using this? Or, and I've purposely not mentioned it till now, but we have a confound in, in that initial experiment. Even if we control for time of day and things like that, the fact that I'm giving one group a pill, that, and all subjects are going to know that they're in a weight loss experiment, I give one group a pill, the other group gets nothing, I've changed their states of mind. I mean, the group that got nothing, they go, oh, we're the control group. Like, they, It's like, oh, we didn't get the weight loss pill. They're not going to try to do anything different. Oh, I may as well have some pizza. I'm not in the, I don't get the weight loss pill. The group that got the weight loss pill, they're going home to eat salad because they're expecting to lose weight. This is why, this is what's known as the placebo effect. Um, you know, some, something like a different mental state is a placebo effect. If you believe that something is going to cause a change, then you will often experience that change, even if that thing isn't causing a change. Okay. That's a weird wording, but uh, for instance, um, if if I if you have a headache and I give you a couple of pills and I tell you that they're they're extra strength Tylenol or Excedrin and you take them and it turns out I gave you a couple of placebos they're just sugar pills they they have no active ingredients your headache is still going to go away or diminish at least that is the placebo effect you are expecting that. You've just taken something that will relieve your headache and your body is going to do things to actually relieve the headache. So when you have an expectation, it affects, it affects the results. And so I created that by giving one group the pill. They knew that they were, they, they were all like, yes, I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to, I may as well start running as well or eating salads. The other group is like all downhearted. Oh, I didn't get in the, in the group. So obviously that is a confound. I don't know if it's the placebo effect causing a, a change, the fact that I created a different mental state, or is it actually the pill? That is why we use placebo pills. They are pills that don't do anything, but you can't tell them apart from the actual weight loss pills. And so when when I run this experiment correctly, every single subject gets a dosage of pills to take for the next four months or however long I'm running it. And so no one knows, did I get the real pill or did I get the placebo? So they're all in the same mental state. They all want to believe that they're on the real pill. So they're all going to behave the same, whether they're actually in the experimental or the control group. And a little, um, a little bit, you may not know about this as well, is that even the people that that work with the, the participants, they won't know what group they're in. The people that are weighing them, they have no idea whether they're weighing somebody in the control group or in the experimental group. And it's really important that, that everyone is blind to it because you will, you know, let's say you're somebody that weighs people, like you'll treat them differently. Oh, here comes a couple more control people. They're probably gonna, you know, not have lost any weight, you know, because they don't have the real pill. Like, you're going to have a different attitude, you know, and anything can affect results. So um, this is why in a, in a well-controlled study, the participants don't know what, what, uh, what group they're in, and the people that actually talk to them and work with them or, or sign them up, they don't know either. It's, uh, there's somebody up top that doesn't actually deal with the, the subjects who actually has little labels. He knows exactly who's in which which group. But 
the pills look exactly the same, everything else is the same. So anyways, a confound is a, is a source of error. And, and placebos or placebo pills are one way to, to get around the confound of, of creating a different mental state in people. Everyone should leave with the same mental state, believing that they may have the pill. Okay, let's go on. Um, population. I, I didn't write this, by the way. It seems to be missing a word, but I just kind of noticed this. Um, the general group of experimenter wants to know, like, I don't really want to know them, but I want to know about them. So there's probably, like, it's probably supposed to say the general group of experimenter wants to know about. Um, so, like, it, the population is, like, what is the group I am studying? So in that weight loss study, I would not be including children or adolescents with a with a with a, a new drug. I probably really would rule out old people as well. So my population might be um, age range of I, I don't know, let's say twenty one to fifty or something like that, and it would include adults in the U.S. I'm only working within the U.S. and also I would want people that are already somewhat overweight. Uh, you know, and, and possibly a lot of overweight, but but I would not want anyone that's underweight or or very fit because it's, it, would, it might actually be dangerous to give them a weight loss pill if they don't need to lose any weight. So I would have a weight restriction. They have to be at least a certain amount overweight. So like you, you kind of narrow down what group is this drug for? You know, who am I interested in? And you and and the, the population is still going to be huge. I mean, you know, if I'm talking United States. There's going to be millions of people still in, in that group I've described. And then from this population, you do some sampling. Um, you come up with a procedure to, to invite people to your study or to select people for your study. Or, and it, sampling can be as simple as I put an ad in the newspaper where whoever responded, as long as they met the criteria you know, of age and weight and things like that, they were in the study. So I it just means like, you know, what was the method you used to gather your subjects? And you actually you actually have to mention this in, in a journal article so people know how your subjects were arrived at, now what kind of sampling procedure did you use? So sampling is a method. The term sample is the actual group of people that are participating in the, in the study. Um, a convenient sample, I touched on this earlier without labeling it in another another learning objective. It's when you use convenient, uh, um, you use people that are convenient for the study, such as college students. So remember I talked about, when I was talking about diversity that a lot of studies were done with, with white, you know, college age, more upper class uh, male students because they were the ones that were typically in colleges and universities in, in, the, in the first half of the 1900s at least. And, and, um, and, I, and I also mentioned that, you know, we still use Psych 101 college students a lot because they are so convenient. If you go to a large university, there will be hundreds of people each term taking Psych 101. And if they have to participate in experiments, you got this whole subject pool for free. They are definitely convenient sample, and they are often used, unfortunately. But it, you know, money is an issue, and and the ease of getting subjects is an issue. So uh, we want what we really want is random samples. We don't always get them because we often turn to the convenience samples. But a random sample is when like every member of your population kind of has an equal chance of ending up in your in your sample, in, in your experiment. Um, and um, if it truly is random, then it should kind of represent the population as a whole, meaning that, you know, I should have some younger members, some older members, like I should have, I should have you know, approximately equal males and females. I should have different races, including the sample. Um, you know, it's, you want it. You want a diverse sample that that that's kind of similar to the population as a whole. And a lot of times, you you know, you can end up with this just by you know doing a wide search of 
uh, like where you put ads in different places and newspapers and online and for people that want to come participate and and you you'll get you know a lot of different types of people coming in um usually it's not completely representative and uh, but in cases where certain variables are really important you might it might not be completely random i talked earlier about um running a study testing aggression between five-year-old boys and girls and i mentioned them at one point hey i might have a laboratory you know uh, playground set up where i have three boys and three girls come in if i'm testing boys versus girls aggression i would certainly want an equal number so like I wouldn't just take the first six kids that came. So, because it would, wouldn't make sense to have four boys and two girls or five girls and one boy, like it would really defeat the purpose. So sometimes you can, if the variable is very important, you can, you limit, you might make limitations on, on who's allowed into the experiment and who's not. So like, you know, once your quota, if, if males versus females is important, once your quota of males, you know, it's full, we might only be starting signing up females after that. Um, but you tend not to do that for every, there's so many variables, diversity variables that if, if they're not really important, you just kind of, you just kind of leave it open and, and hope that you get a good mix in most cases. But random assignments are very different than random samples. They both start with random, but they are two different concepts. And I, I know there was a diagram on the last page about this, but I'm just going to skip that. You guys, I don't talk about every diagram you see because I know they're in your book, and I figure you guys are reading the textbook as well as, <laughs> excuse me, I know my, I'm so hoarse now, as well as listening to these video lectures. So, um, anyways, to go on, random assignment means that once I have like my total subject pool, you know, my total sample chosen that every member has an equal chance of ending up in any of the groups that are available. So I told you that, you know, in that drug study, I start with 200 and then, you know, I put 100 in the control group, 100 in the experimental group. Well, I can't like hand pick them or anything. It's gotta be some kind of random process. So, that, you know, each one of them could have ended up in either group. And this is incredibly important. It may sound like a small thing, but but what this what this kind of out, um, not outlaws, but what this tells you uh, can't happen is that if you ever start with pre-existing groups, you've broken this random assignment rule, and it means it's not a true experiment. And I'll give you an example. You know, you guys don't know this, but I'm actually running an experiment this summer. And I have a one-on-one -on -one class here uh, uh, out of MCC. You guys are this one-on-one -on -one class. And I also teach a, an online one-on-one -on -one class at the University of Rochester. So I have two groups to start with. And you know what? You guys are getting the video lectures. They are getting everything else the same. They got the same tests, the same assignments, but they do, do not get any video lectures. And I want to see the, you know, how much video lectures affect final grades? Well, I didn't do any random assignment. You guys didn't have an equal chance of ending up in the MCC or the U of R group. You were already in the MCC group. When I started the study, they were already in the U of R group. When you start an experiment with a pre-existing group, there's no random assignment. And what this introduces is that there are probably systematic differences between the two groups to begin with. And I'm not going to say that U of R students are any more intelligent or smarter or do better in school, but, but there are probably some differences between those who choose to go to U of R and get accepted and those who choose to go to MCC. So at the end of the course, when I compare final grades, I can't say that my video lectures had anything to do with it or not. Probably the, the two groups are destined to get different final grades. I don't know, maybe you guys score higher, maybe they score higher, whatever. But it doesn't, you don't even have to identify the differences, but there would be there would be some differences between the two groups. To do it properly, a true experiment, 
you know, I would have to say, okay, you're going to be in the U of R group. You know, I flip a coin, you're going to be in the MCC group. Um, and this is this is the importance of random assignment. If there is, if it doesn't exist, there are going to be differences in the groups to start. Okay, everyone's got to once again have an equal chance of ending up in any group. I'm going to move on now, and this is going to wrap up this section on experiments. Uh, this is this is not a new book. It's a little diagram I, I originally used in my adolescent class, but um, it goes over a lot of the terms we talked about. So, you know, up top, I just talked about random assignment. So we start, we got a whole group of participants. We randomly assign them to experimental control groups. It might be like, like I said, flipping a coin or often they have like balls they draw, you know, like there's some, or it might be computer randomization that puts them in the groups, whatever, some method to just randomly split them up. So then I split them into two groups. You can see them labeled experimental group. In this particular study, um, I want to find out if, if I introduce a time management program, whether it's going to affect grades or not. And this is particularly, particularly for adolescents. You can see the hypothesis at the bottom does, you know, does a time management program improve students' grades? So, anyways, so that means the experimental group is a group that gets the time management program. They are the group that I'm doing something new with, or you know, introducing something new to. The control group, well, they're there's they don't get it. <laughs> I, you know, they're they're, they're still in the study. They're still attending all the classes and doing everything else the same as the other group, but they don't get the specialized time management program to to you know work through at home or whatever and uh, um okay so we we've done one thing different we made as this label here that's the independent variable you can see it in the yellow bar it is the one thing that i've changed between the two groups i gave one a time management program the other one not we over at the left you see cause and effect in every experiment we we want to find out does the independent variable cause and effect in the dependent variable. In this case, based on my hypothesis, the dependent variable is grades. I'm thinking that this time management program will improve grades. So the dependent variable, also known as data, or starting with D, is the grades that they end up with in, in school. And so if we find a difference between the two groups, when we measure the data, the dependent variable, we can conclude and once, what I should call it a, a statistically significant difference between the two groups in the final grades, we can make a conclusion the independent variable caused a change in the dependent variable, or, you know, more directly, I should say, my time management program uh, did indeed improve adolescence grades. It causes adolescence grades to improve. And, and this is, this, you know, in the, these are the, this is a nice little diagram because these are all terms that we went over. And this is, a, is the simplest kind of basic setup that, of how an experiment works. And that will bring us to the end of chapter, um, learning objective eight. Okay, two more to go. Oops. Uh, am I still recording? Probably, yeah. Okay.